conference was recorded the weekend of March 19th and 20th, 1993, in St. Paul, Minnesota, at the Queen of Peace Friary of the Franciscan Brothers of Peace. Now, these tapes are not of professional production quality, but we do believe that a careful and prayerful use of these tapes will help individuals and communities move into a fuller and deeper life with Jesus. Each one of the conferences will stand on its own merit, but the design and intention is to form a mosaic. In his first teaching, Father talks to us about trust, the nature and role of trust in our relationship with our Creator. The second conference might be most appropriately entitled From Calvary to Nagasaki, An Alchemy of Christian Spirit. In the third conference, Father discusses the two incontrovertible, fundamental problems of existence, the problems of evil and of death. The fourth conference is a powerful presentation on means and ends. In the fifth conference, Father explicates the great test passage of Matthew 25, wherein Jesus tells us on what basis it is our lives will be judged. In his concluding conference, Father sums up the reasons and rationale for the gospel ethic, the gospel imperative of nonviolent love. For 25 years now, Father Emmanuel Charles McCarthy has conducted his workshop on Christian nonviolent love throughout the English speaking world. Father holds a doctorate in civil law and master's degrees in theology and in English education. In 1992, Father was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. It is my privilege and my honor to present to you Father Emmanuel Charles McCarthy. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I cannot see the road ahead of me, and I do not know for certain where it will end. Nor do I know myself. And the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually going so. But I believe that the desire to love as Christ has loved does in fact please you. I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore will I trust you always. I may seem to be lost in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone.
This is a conference about the mercy of God. It is also a conference about peace. Those two are intimately related. They cannot be disconnected. If one had to put in one sentence the theme of the conference that we have here this weekend, it is that the world will not, the world cannot have peace till it trust in the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. The world will not, the world cannot have peace until it trust in the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. That's what we're talking about this weekend. And by the world, we want to be very clear. We mean not only me personally. We, need, we mean not only those folks that um, I know personally. We mean humanity. All humanity. Past, present, and future. Only by trusting in the mercy of God in Jesus Christ can humanity have peace. It is not a way of achieving peace. It's the way of achieving peace. Now when I give that sentence, what people normally focus on, and rightfully so, are the words mercy and peace and God and Jesus Christ. But for our opening tonight, I'd like to begin by reflecting on one of the words in that sentence that is not one of those words. And that is the word trust. The world will not, cannot have peace until it trusts in the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. What does it mean to trust in God? What does it mean to trust in the mercy of God? What does it mean to trust in the mercy of God in Jesus Christ? Well, the first thing that we have to do before we can reflect on the expanded dimensions, trust in God, trust in the mercy of God, trust in the mercy of God in Jesus Christ, we have to first reflect on trust. Trust is the sine qua non, that without which there is no Christianity and no Judaism. Trust is the irreplaceable fundamental reality that the human being has to engage in if that human being is to intentionally be an agent of the divine will, of divine power. There is no exception. It is simply a fact of the spiritual life. The Hebrew word for trust is amuna. It would be spelled in English E-M-M-U-N-A-H, amuna. It is a fundamental notion in, in the Old Testament as well as in the New. As you know, the Hebrew Scripture is not a communication by definition of words or, or a communication by uh, theological treatise. It is a communication of God's action with the people, fundamentally through stories and so forth. We all know who the father of faith is. 
father of faith for Judaism, for Christianity, and for Islam is Abraham. Abraham is the father of faith because Abraham is the incarnation of primal human trust in God. That quality without which God still is, but that quality without which God cannot use us as God wants to use us, as God created us to be and to be used. Let me explain. You remember the story of Abraham and Sarah? Abraham and Sarah are, uh, they are, uh, Abraham's a hundred. Sarah's 94. They have no children. Sarah's barren. So one day there are, there comes along three angels, three men, three messengers of God, or the Holy Trinity, depending upon how you interpret the scripture. And uh, they promise that Sarah, who is barren for all her life, and who's 94, and Abraham, who's 100, they're going to have a child. Not only that, you know, Abraham is communicating to him that his descendants will be as the as number as the stars in the heavens, as the sands on the sea. Well, if you can kind of work with the situation a little and think of what's being said here, what is being said here is that the impossible will be. We're talking about people that lived perhaps 4,000 years ago lived utterly in the context of a nature reality, huh? Limited technology and so forth and so on. And they, have, they absolutely positively know, as you and I know today, no one who is 94 years old has a child. There's no question what the story is communicating. It's communicating that they have been told the impossible will happen. And so they go on, and indeed, a year later, the impossible does happen, and Isaac is born. Isaac, by the way, in Hebrew means God smiles. So I can't do it, huh? And we know from the story that Isaac grows, and he grows, and like any family, and so forth and so on, there is a love relationship that develops, and... Uh, and, and life goes on. But then there comes that paragraph. It's only a paragraph. That terrible paragraph that not one of us would ever want to have happen to us. Abraham receives a communication from God that he is to sacrifice Isaac. Now, this would not be, by the way, something that Abraham would have made up. First of all, we know how prone he would be to hear that. He would be prone to hear that because Abraham lived in a world where child sacrifice was not abnormal. If you can... <coughs> if you can get a sense of how the little tiny human being living in the context of raw nature can be terrified by lightning, by disease, by all the things that can destroy. Huh? To placate the gods was terribly important. To offer the first fruits was thought to be the way of placating the gods because the first fruits represented the best. And we know because we have digs, uh, archaeological uh, excavations today, that at the time of Abraham there were whole temples and the walls of those temples have nothing in them but vases containing the firstborn of children. That's in Iraq, 
That's where Abraham would have been at the time this happened. So it's not a message that was absolutely foreign to Abraham to sacrifice the son. And so he goes in that one paragraph. You remember the paragraph. He and Isaac go to Mount Moriah. The walk from home to Mount Moriah that covers one paragraph in Hebrew scriptures is probably the most commentated on part of Hebrew scripture by the rabbis over the century. That little one paragraph has received more comment, more reflection than any other passage in Hebrew scripture. Because as the rabbis reflected on the story, it was very, very clear. Everything is riding on what goes here. And therefore, while they embellish things and they talked and so forth and so on, the enormity of the reflection was tied to the fact that what was understood was something awesome was at stake at this moment. And so, the stories go like this that the rabbis have written. As they're going along, Abraham saying to himself, I've got my child. Leave God now. You've got what you want. Don't lose everything now that you have it and you finally have it. Isaac's think, uh, Isaac is thinking, this guy has had his life, but I haven't had mine. Don't go with him. Don't obey him. Abraham's thinking, could I be wrong? Am I senile? Isaac is thinking, if he's going to kill me, I should kill him first. And these conversations, basically temptations, huh? go on and on and on, and you could imagine what it would be if one, if you or I were really in the situation. And that's basically the storytelling part that the rabbis deal with, that walk. Now we come back to the one paragraph in Scripture itself. Now they are going up Mount Moriah. And scripture says that Isaac says to Abraham, Isaac who is carrying the, 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 the logs for his own destruction on his back, he says to Abraham, where is, this, where is the lamb? And Abraham says, God will provide. And he goes on in trust until that very last moment when he lifts the knife and then some kind of revelation hits him. Some kind of communication from God comes to him that I do not want blood sacrifice. The ram is over there in the bush. Abraham comes down and we're here today. And so is Mohammed and Moses and Jesus and Paul and St. Francis, and so forth. Now, can you imagine, now, just hold that for a second, that is the fundamental, the primitive response in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scripture, to God in trust. We know, back in the Garden of Eden, it is precisely because Adam and Eve refused to trust God <coughs> God says, don't touch that. And something into their minds, and they do, they don't trust God. So now we begin a different process with Abraham. Trust. Then we go on to the giant, huh? Moses. And we know, all know the story of Moses. Moses, as we remember, is now... He has freed the Hebrews from Egypt. They are on the desert. The 
sun is overhead beating down on them. Pharaoh has changed his mind. He's coming after them. And there's nothing but the sea in front of them. The people are rioting. They are saying, why didn't you leave us back in Egypt? At least we could have had our families. At least we could have had some fun. At least we could have had normal living. This revolt, the sun overhead, the murderous army and coming after them, which meant death and destruction and torture and pain and rape, and everything you can imagine. And they saw it coming, and nothing but the sea in front of them. So Moses goes to the mountain. And he explains the whole situation to God. Pharaoh's coming to kill us. We've got nothing but the sea in front of us. We're living under this terrible sun. The people are in revolt. What am I to do? And this is what it says in Scripture. God says two words to him and only two words. March on. That's all God says. He says no more. March on. He doesn't tell Moses this, this, nothing. He just says, march on. Now Moses comes down to the mountain and he marches on. And of course we know what happens after that. Because he marches on, the sea parts, because he marches on, Jesus is born. We have a Eucharist, we're here. Imagine what it would be for either Abraham or Moses. Let's take Abraham for a minute. Suppose Abraham bought his various thoughts on the subject, and then he said to himself, instead of when Isaac said, God, you know, where's the lamb, God? And he says, God will provide. Abraham says, well, I know God will provide, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I think I'm going to get a lamb. <laughs> you know, I'm going to get one. And I'll have one, and uh, that's just as good, you know. Or Moses, when God says, marches on, he comes down from the mountain, huh? And suppose Moses says when he comes down from the mountain, suppose he says, uh, I know God said march on, but hey, look, Aaron, go back and see if he can work out a little treaty with the, uh, with the emperor. I mean, God didn't say to do that, but you know, that's reasonable. It doesn't work, does it? It doesn't work. Now suppose you or I, suppose we lived 2,000 years ago. And the world's a terrible place. A lot of misery, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. A lot of oppression. And suppose you and I had all the power we could want. And then we wanted to change the world. Where would we go 2,000 years ago to change the world? Well, maybe some of us would go to the, uh, to the Roman Senate, you know, and, uh, and, and, and get the necessary votes to do things. Or maybe some of us would overthrow Caesar. That would change the world. We could really, we'd be at the top then. Or maybe get control of the military. Or maybe the educational system, you know. The one who rules the teachers' colleges rules the world or something like that. But when God decided, in his omniscience and his mercy, to change the world, God didn't go to any of those places. He went to a teenage girl on the side of a hill in Galilee. And he asked her to go through an impossible ordeal. He asked her to become an unwed mother. In as grotesque patriarchal society as can be imagined. In a society where the men daily prayed and thank God they were not women. In a society where women had the same rights as animals, they were totally owned by whoever the males were that be in the family, the husband, the father, or whatever the case may be. In a society that killed people for getting pregnant outside of marriage. And if they didn't kill them, ostracized them in such a way that they would be better off dead. 
And that kind of society, a gruesome male society, angry and hostile and loaded with macho fears of all kinds, and that society, a little girl is asked to become an unwed mother by God. And the question is whether she's going to trust. Whether there will be Abrahamic and Mosaic trust there. That trust that made Abraham's descendants number as the stars of the sea and that trust that opened the Red Sea and gave everything after that. Will that trust exist in Mary? Mariam is her name, really. And of course she says, Be done unto me according to your word. The fathers of the church talk about that moment between the time God asked and the time Mary answered, Be done unto me according to your word. They say in those instances, the angels in heaven held their breath. Because Mary had to choose to trust before the incarnation could take place. God does not rape. God loves. God asks. And in freedom we may trust or we may not. Mary said, Be it done unto me according to your word. And then 33 years later, more or less, 33 years later, there's Jesus, great teacher, great healer, to this very day thought to be the greatest or one of the greatest moral religious teachers, minds, personalities that have ever lived, whether you're Christian or not. The healing exploits, one third of the gospel is Jesus healing. They had to be phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal and instantaneous. And all that time during his public life of three years, he taught and lived a certain kind of teaching. Basically what is found in the Sermon on the Mount. And now through a whole bunch of mechanizations of evil and people who have allowed themselves to become full of evil. He's in Gethsemane. And he's in terrible shape. He is saying, Father, let this cup pass from me if at all possible. This is not someone going to his death like Socrates drinking the, uh, the hemlock and just passing out. This is not someone, uh, you know, who got a tremendous amount of confidence in life after life experiences. This is someone that knows that there is nothing more abnormal than the separation of body and soul. It was never meant to be. And this is someone who knows what crucifixion is. It is agony and suffocation to the end. And knows a lot more than that. It says that Jesus is praying on the ground. He's prostrated, it says in the gospel. Jews did not pray that way. But we all know that when you get in those extreme states of terror and anguish and agony, that's how you function. He wants out if possible. And he says, let this cup pass from me if possible. But then he says, but your will, not mine, be done. And then there's a scuffle. The armed servant, the high priest, and his henchmen come, huh? And they, they uh, come to arrest Jesus. Jesus. 
Peter takes out his sword and he cuts off the ear, the armed servant of the high priest. Now, you know, <clears throat> makes no difference if you're Rambo. Someone takes off your ear and you're screeching like a baby on the ground. You've got raw nerves exposed to the raw atmosphere and you're crazy in pain. That's what real war is, by the way. You're absolutely out of your mind in agony. You're not dead, but you wish you were. And this is not going to stop for a long, long time, if ever. That's what the armed servant of the high priest was when Peter slashed off the ear. Now for three years, Jesus has been teaching. God is Abba of all. He is the Father of all. He loves all. The enemy of the state is not the enemy of God. The enemy of the state is the enemy of the child, of, is, is a child of God who is to be loved as God loves them. The, yet my enemy is not the enemy of God. My enemy is a child of God who is to be loved as God loves this person. God wants what's good. Jesus knows he has healing power in the extreme. Probably at this moment he wishes he didn't have it. But here's his choice. For three years he has been teaching without reservation, love your enemies. God is the father of all, God loves all. Be merciful as your heavenly father is merciful. Be compassionate as your heavenly father is compassionate. I want mercy, not sacrifice. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And here's this man lying on the ground in absolute agony. And Jesus knows he has the power to bring him peace and healing. And so, the crises of trust, of Amuna. He wants out, we know that. Because he just said, Father, please, if possible, but your will. And what is the Father's will? The one who says, I love God, but does not love the neighbor. And for Jesus, the neighbor includes the enemy. Is a liar. The Father's will is serve. But he's the enemy. But he's my child. But if I serve him, he'll take me to my death. My will is that he be loved. I'll take care of the rest. And so with total trust, with nothing but trust, and one can imagine, Jesus goes over and heals the ear, it says, of the man who's going to take him to his death. Now it's hard to get this out in English, but in Greek, huh? This is the end of Jesus' control over life. From that point on, Jesus is taken and moved. He has no more control as a physical being. In order for him to do this, he literally had to give up his life to heal the enemy. Why did he do it? Because he trusted that the will of God who is love and who is mercy, who is peace, and who loves not only those I love, but loves those I don't love, who loves not only those who are going to do well to me, but those who are going to do harm to me, that that will of God had to be served. And so he went forward in trust. The reason for starting here is this. Tolstoy, in the book that uh, converted Gandhi, The Kingdom of God is Within You, talking about Christianity as he knew it, which was basically Russian Orthodox and Roman Catholic, says, of Christianity in his time, which is a little more than 100, 100 years ago, maybe. Huh? 
He says, Christians try to arrange their affairs in every instance so that things go well. Whether God exists or doesn't exist, whether Christ is risen or isn't risen, <coughs> the fact is that Christians have to risk everything on Christ is risen. What he is saying there is a fundamental spiritual truth. 99.99% trust in God is no trust. Is no trust. 99, 44, 100% trust in me or your neighbor, that's 99, 44, 100% trust. But if it's God, it's either all or nothing. Because the minute I say, I don't trust you, God, I say, you are not God. It's that simple. The minute I say I don't trust what you said, God, I am saying, you didn't say that, God. Or if you did say it, you're not God. The world will not have peace till it trusts in the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. When Philip is asked, when Philip asked Jesus, show us the Father, Jesus says, he who sees me sees the Father. The Father and I are one. What Jesus is the communicator of is the true, the living, the one, the only God. What Jesus says is the will of God. What Gandhi says is fit. Gandhi says it. That's Gandhi. Yeah? His thoughts are no better than my thoughts. Jesus, as the incarnation of God, as the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, his thoughts are God's thoughts. His words are God's words. No mediator. He is it. Therefore, to distrust Jesus as a Christian is to distrust God. There is no other God for the Christian than the God who is revealed through Jesus Christ. That's it. And therefore, when I say, Jesus, I, I know you said this, Jesus, but I trust you. What I'm saying is, I don't believe you are who the church says you are. It is one of the roots, where we're getting close to something that is one of the roots of anti-Semitism in Christianity. That's seldom talked about, but sits there. And anti-Semitism is real in Christianity, and it's rampant. All forms of Christianity, Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant. You see, Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the confession of faith. Chinese don't know about Messiah. Japanese don't know about Messiah. Hindus don't know about Messiah. Hmm? American Indians don't know about Messiah. Aztecs don't know about Messiah. There's only one group that knows about Messiah. Jews. Their whole world is the Messiah. They are the one that brought the notion into the world. They are the one that lived by the hope. Even Christianity, who says the Messiah has come, used Jewish documents to authenticate it. To teach it. The Old Testament. But every Jew knows this. When the Messiah comes, the Messiah, of course, is the ultimate communicator from God. The Messiah brings the way to everything that the human heart desires that's good and holy. And therefore, when the Messiah comes, the Messiah 
is given that level of trust which is only given to God. Therefore, the Jewish community says the Messiah hasn't come. Because the day the Messiah comes, if the Messiah says, hitch up that wagon to that mosquito, because that mosquito is going to pull the wagon, you hitch up the wagon to the mosquito, you don't say the mosquito can't pull the wagon. And the Jewish community looks and says to the Christian community, here's what Jesus said. You're not even within 100,000 light years of it in the way you're living. You don't trust Jesus. You no more believe the Messiah came than we do. You live just like us. You're indistinguishable. You go, we go Saturday, you go Sunday, you go, but living, right? there's a difference. You live like pre-Messianic people, just like we live like pre-Messianic people. Our pre-Messianic life is utterly different than the life that Jesus taught. That's clear. No Jew is going to deny that. In fact, the literature abounds that talks about, I mean, Jewish literature abounds that talks about the fact that the Jewish people, the first century of time of Jesus, were too smart to buy into that kind of, kind of consciousness that Jesus was teaching because it would have destroyed the community. There is absolutely no question of what Jesus teaches. Some of it's noble, some of it's consistent with Christianity. I mean, some of it's consistent with Judaism, but some of it goes infinitely beyond Judaism. For example, Martin Buber, the leading Jewish scholar of the 20th century, says, Jesus' teaching of love your enemies is rooted in Judaism, but infinitely transcends Judaism. And there's not a scripture scholar in the world, not one, Jewish or Christian or secular, that says anything other than love your enemies is the very words of Jesus. And it has no, it absolutely has no precedent whatsoever in Judaism, the way Jesus taught it, which was a total presentation of any enemy at any time, anywhere. So the Jew says, it's clear. Your Messiah teaches this. You don't follow it. You don't believe he's the Messiah. Case closed. In modern times, everyone is a little more ecumenically tactful. <laughs> but by the very nature that the Jewish community exists, it says that it does not believe what Christianity is saying is messianic is messianic. And this gnaws and gnaws in a way that the Chinese community, Japanese community, Hindu community, Native American community cannot. For they know nothing about Messiah. Not Messiah in the context of Christ. They know the Christian Christ. But the Hebrew Messiah... Therefore, we are confronted with a very difficult spiritual truth, which is, there seems to be no doubt that trust in Jesus is not only normal in terms of what would be expected from the Messiah, God-like trust, not total trust, not 99.99. It seems like Jesus actually called for that himself. When Jesus says, give up everything, follow me, and all those things, you know, etc., etc., all that following me is about trust. And none of it seems to be modified. Follow me when it's easy. And, no, he didn't say that. Follow me when it help you keep your job? Well, she doesn't say that either. Follow me when it doesn't, uh, <clears throat> you know, cost you your life? Doesn't say that either. It says just follow me. It's total. 
Oh, this is all too much. You know, this is just, this is just too much now. We're just, I mean, there's no sense whatsoever, you know? Just no sense whatsoever going this far with it. It's just pushing the gospel too far. You know? The way it's usually said is, this is being a purist. That's, that's the way it's gotten around. This is being a purist. A clever way of responding to that is to say, where does Jesus teach that anyone can be an impurist? But consider this. Consider this. Don't, in any area of life, Don't you have to be a purist? Say in science. Say in your technology, let alone in science. Don't you have to be a purist in science in order for everything to work right? And if you're not a purist, it doesn't work right. By a purist, I mean you've got to do it all correctly. For example, those racing cars that are out in... Uh, Utah and the salt flats, the ones that travel 600 miles an hour and so forth and so on, are aerodynamically structured so the wind flows certain ways, the paint is just right, and God, everything, you know? Yeah. Suppose you had one of those cars. It can go 600 miles an hour. And suppose you get it out there in Utah salt flats. And I mean, you've got every little bolt in it, fine-tuned you. It's, it, it's, a, it's a handmade job here. It is just for every little thing you've got perfect. And you've got the, the, the gas with the octane. I mean, you've got it measured down. It's perfect. And you're ready to go. You step on the gas and you really let it have. You know, you really go. And the thing just goes along at about 10 to 15 miles an hour. And you say, well, I did everything. Look, here's the man. I did everything. And you say, but you didn't do this. You, I mean, you look what you did. You left off the left wheel. <laughs> <laughs> ah, come on. You want to get a purist or something? <laughs> oh, you're dialing a telephone number. You know? It says dial 617-588-1008. You know? And you dial 617-588-1009. And you get, you know, and you get someone all together. And you say, you know, and you say, ah, oh, come on, I got most of the numbers. <laughs> hmm? No, you can't, that's not the way real life works. That's not the way... Christianity works. Jacques Maritain was the teacher of three popes. He was the, if you will, by far and universally recognized as the, as the, 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 the premier Catholic philosopher of the 20th century. When he died, or just before he died, uh, in an interview he was asked, uh, is the world any better today the time of Jesus and his answer was no and who could say it was any better who in their right mind could say the world was any better today than at the time of Jesus <laughs> this century alone more human beings have been slaughtered in war than in all the centuries of history combined and we know what that means. Because someone had to do the slaughtering. And someone had to go home with the mind of a murderer to raise children and family and all that that entailed. You don't kill without having both parties dying in the process. And all the misery for the families of those who died makes no difference where, China, Japan, Germany, America, men, that's not the issue. One person dies every nine seconds of starvation in this world. One every six from a disease that could be inoculated against. And we could go on and on and on, huh? No, Maritime is right. Nothing. Is the world any better than the time of Jesus? 
She says, no. And of course, the Jewish community knows the Messiah is the Redeemer. And whether they ever say it out loud in these times of, uh, of squeamishness, if you will, to speak hard truths, unless it's hard truths about sex, I suppose, and no squeamishness. But they know. And they, the Messiah is the Redeemer. And all they have to do is stand there. And just by their very presence, they ask the question, which some will ask out loud. If Jesus is the Redeemer, why doesn't the world look more redeemed? Why doesn't the world look? We're not talking about a minor Redeemer here. We're talking about God becoming human. We're talking about the Messiah. And we're talking about 2,000 years and nothing has changed. And so they know when the Messiah comes, the Messiah, things happen. I mean, good things happen. First to Israel and then to the rest of the world. Why doesn't the world look more redeemed if Jesus is the Redeemer? And of course we have that smart alecky answer from Chesterton, huh? Well, it's not that Christianity has been tried and failed. It is that Christianity has been found too difficult and therefore not tried. Ha ha. Grotesque. Grotesque. I mean, a Jewish person just listens to that and shakes the head in silence. If the Messiah speaks, you not only try, you give your life to do it. There have been in Judaism a whole bunch of false messiahs, huh? who have come along over the time. But whoever adhered to them, huh? whoever chose them to follow them, it was total. There was no question. Huh? The totality of the commitment that the, that the Messiah brings. To hear the answer, it is not that Christianity has been tried and failed, it's that it has been found too difficult and therefore not tried, ha ha, as the reason why the world doesn't look more redeemed. There couldn't be a more dreadful indictment of the church or of us individually. But after we put all this together, what we come down to is the failure of trust in Jesus. We will not trust. And yet, there is no other way to do it. Think about this for a minute. When we say Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God, we are saying that this person has maximal, absolute maximal authority in matters relating to God. This one knows how human beings should act. This one knows what is the divine will. This one has the vision of God. That's what's being presented. He, to say it in the, in the words we technically use, this one has authority. What authority? The authority of God. You know, you go into any Byzantine church, Catholic or Orthodox, they, in Byzantine churches they don't have a spire, they have a dome. And in that dome, if the church has the money and so forth and so on, there's an icon. And the icon is always the same. It's Christ, the Pantocrator, which is just the Greek, but Christ with all authority. The dome is the universe, the cosmos. It comes from the close, the very last paragraph of the Gospel of St. Matthew. When Jesus says, in the very last paragraph, Matthew 28, he says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Pontica. Go ye therefore and baptize all nations in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. 
And know that I am with you all days, even until the consummation of the world. All authority has been given to him. All means God. That's what we're talking about there. There is no other authority but this. This is ultimate, maximal. There is nothing that supersedes it, overrides it. This is it. Jesus is ultimate authority. It's not that what he says is a good idea. It's what he says is the will and the life of God. And what is contrary to it is death and evil. It's that total. We all have to obey authority. We obey authorities every day, far less than Jesus, infinitely less than Jesus. And we do it unquestioningly. Suppose, for example, you were to uh, say you never had a telephone. Never had a telephone in your life. So you want a telephone. So you get on the telephone company. And uh, say you want your telephone. Fine. Two, two weeks later, they come and they, they install a telephone, you know, and they put it here and they, you know, make it, show you how to use it and everything. And they make a little hole in the wall, you know, with this line going up and out and so forth. And, and they make the little hole, just a tiny little hole, you know, I know, put it right there, you know. And then they say, well, look, anytime you want to use a telephone, you know, just make sure that that wire is in that hole, and then, you know, here you call any place. 45 seconds, you can call Moscow, London, Tokyo. It's there. It's to be clear as a bell. Just just, uh, just put that plug in the hole, and then dial your number and everything else. That's what the telephone man tells you. Oh. Okay. So you decide a week later you want to call Aunt Bridget in Dublin. Huh? So you say, you say, I think I'll call Bridgie in Dublin. You know? So you say, okay, what's the number? And you look up the number. And you say, uh, pick up the phone, and there's nothing there, it's dead. So you look at, oh, that's right, I gotta put this, I gotta put this, uh, I gotta put this little plug in the hole there. Gee, you put the hole awfully low. And there's a hole up here, I'll put it in here instead. <laughs> and then you just put it in there, and you dial the number, and you're waiting on the phone. No answer. So he said, well, you know, it's not reasonable that I have to stoop down there to put it in the hole. Well, this is a... This is a yellow hole over here. Yellow's close to gold. Gold's close to God. I'll put it in this one. Put it, put it in that one. You dial the number again. And you say, Bridget, 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 where are you? No, no answer, you know. Now, can you imagine... Can you imagine what the status of Ma Bell would be today if no one accepted the authority of her teachers? Or if her teachers were going around and instead of putting the right hole in there and telling me they were putting all kinds of just put it in the old hole, you know? Well, you know what it would be. This would be the case today with the telephone. We wouldn't be dialing and then in 45 seconds getting Moscow and so forth and so on, huh? Do it as the authority says in a purest sort of way, and tremendous power is released. The power to talk to Moscow instantaneously, 45 seconds of an instantaneous conversation, all halfway around the world. But don't do it that way. And suppose we weren't doing it that way for the last 70, 80, 90, well, I guess 100 years now almost, huh? Suppose what was any old hole you could put in there? Well, people would be picking up the phone and calling, and their voice would probably go out 150, 200 feet at the most if they had good lungs. And no one would be calling Moscow. Everyone could only reach out 200, 250 feet, uh, 150 feet. But I suppose then what we would have would be a whole public relations campaign telling us why that's so good. And that's really what was meant to be. Because we didn't trust authority. This is no minor problem. This is something that enters into the church. And we'll talk about this after our break. This is something that enters the church after Constantine. 
This is not there. This distrust in the authority of Jesus, this distrust in the authority of God, is not there the way it is now in the first three centuries of Christianity. This is... The fathers of the church after Constantine, Constantine is about 313, the fathers of the church after Constantine, a couple of centuries after, after Constantine and on out, used to write that if we should be now grateful to God, because Christianity is in such bad shape, we should be grateful to God now that we have to suffer and die. Because if we didn't suffer and die, we would never trust God. It is only suffering and that terrible reality of death that forces us to stop trusting in what is not God and puts us in contact with what we should have been doing since we were baptized. After all, the word baptism in Greek means total immersion. Total immersion. It's a total giving of self. There's a story, whether it's legendary or not, or true, we really don't know. But when, when, uh, when in Russia, Ivan the Terrible wanted to become a Christian, now, now, Ivan the Terrible was called Ivan the Terrible. He's a pretty terrible guy. This was no one to fool with, huh? Uh, he, uh, he carried on a pretty, uh, a pretty terrible life in terms of torturing and uh, killing and so forth and so on, and his, uh, and his merry men, too. So anyway, the time came they wanted to be Christian. And the... Uh, so the bishop in those days, I mean, that's still done in the Eastern Church and a lot of the Western uh, Protestant churches, since baptism means total immersion, people are totally immersed under the water, you know? And uh, <clears throat> at that time, it was the river. You'd take the people down the river and baptize them, see? So the, Ivan the Terrible and his men come down the river, they're all going to be baptized Christian. So they have to take off their clothes and they're naked and so forth and so on. Uh, but they don't take off their swords. Because all the people up there in the hill, and um, they know what's going to happen if they take off their swords, people are going to tear them apart. So they go into baptism with the swords on. The bishop says, wait a minute. That's impossible. You can't wear your sword and be baptized. You've got to be totally naked. This is the old man dying, the new man rising, and so forth. You know, you can't, you've you got to be totally naked when you go in the river. It's got to be a total immersion. And they said, we're not going to take off the swords. They'll kill us. They'll tear us apart. And uh, he said, you got to take off the swords. We won't take off the swords. You know, this is the way it is. So a compromise worked out. They, they didn't have the swords on. What they did, they took the swords in their hand. They all went in the river and they held the sword up above the water. So that the, the, the whole body was, the soul was above the body. How much of that is exactly what Christianity is today and for so, so long? I will trust, but I will not trust where it gets difficult. I will not trust like Abraham, Moses, Mary and Jesus. And hence, the whole process is short-circuited. The energy that's supposed to flow through the church is literally stopped at a certain point. It can't go any further. We do have phenomenal, phenomenal examples in the church of those who did trust with phenomenal consequences coming from their lives. And we'll talk about that tomorrow. We have in the Gospel a number of what can only be called hard sayings. And those sayings represent the will of God as revealed by Jesus. The question is whether we're going to trust in them. Why trust in them? Number one, because they're the will of God 
We have been given the gift of faith in Christianity, and that's what we were created for and given the gift of faith for, to trust in these sayings and nothing else. To trust in Jesus, in other words. But number two, those sayings and the trust that's involved in choosing them, they represent God's mercy, not just to us, but in some mysterious way, how God wants to use us in order to send his mercy out to others in the world. And if we refuse to say yes, like Abraham, Moses, Mary, and Jesus, who in their own time could never have seen what's going to happen from the action, huh? Never could they have imagined in their wildest dreams what was coming. All they had in front of them was God wanted this and to do it or not to do it. And here we are 4,000 years later talking about it. And therefore we have to begin on this note. Any conference that deals with the issue of Jesus' teachings of nonviolence. has to deal with the Christian community's nurturing in a world of rationalizations and justifications of why it can distrust what Jesus said. It is a nurturing that starts in childhood. I remember one time at a conference I said I was talking about Jesus' teaching of love of enemies and there was a French woman there and I remember she said in response to that she said uh, she said thinking that's just if you don't love your enemies you've got to watch your enemies oh, 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 and so forth and so on huh? if you really mean enemies and she said well she said Jesus might have been God but he wasn't stupid <laughs> But that consciousness, huh? that was nurtured in her, and that is the consciousness of the church. Jesus is not a realist. He really doesn't know what's up in the situation. He doesn't have the authority. Or what he says is not really the will of God. It's open to my modification when I see a better way. And after all is said and done, what the issue is, is I will not trust because I'm afraid if I trust I will be hurt. I will not trust because I am afraid if I trust I will be hurt. I will not say no to the gun. I will not say no to retaliation. I will not say no to enmity. Individually, or when these things are in institutions like states. Because I fear I will be hurt. And of course that is so. Huh? Abraham had to choose in the face of human fears. Moses had to choose in the face of human fears. Mary had to choose in the face of human fears. Jesus had to choose in the face of human fears. But they chose not because they wanted to live in fear. They chose because this was the will of God. And they believed God was God. And God honored those who honored him. He would not abandon them. Oft times we sit in the chapel. And we hear people sitting in the chapel. And they say, or in their rooms, Jesus, I trust in you. Father, I abandon myself to you. 
And with their whole heart they say this. And then, precisely they walk out of the place after just making this commitment. And when one of the teachings of Jesus comes in conflict with what they see as security, out the window goes the teaching of Jesus. Abandonment to Christ God is abandonment to the teachings of Christ God. They cannot be separated. It, it's not abandoning oneself to some kind of amorphous cloud or blob of bliss. It's a concrete human personality who is divine that said this, this, and this. And the abandonment is not just for me, the abandonment is for others. Because whether it's Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Mary, or on out to St. Teresa, Lizier, St. Francis, or whatever the case may be, huh? the abandonment is an abandonment to the merciful will of God so God can act through me to do good things in the world. In ways that I can't imagine. So let's conclude this part of the talk, this part of the evening, with just this reflection, since we're in a Franciscan house. A child is born in 1184. John Bernardino. His father is away from uh, Italy. He's in France. The father comes back since he was in France. He names him Francis. Renames him. The child lives. He reads the gospel. Somehow it gets into him that he has to trust God, and not just in terms of the things that are easy in the gospel, but he has to trust Jesus in terms of what's there that cultural Christianity says, oh, you can avoid that, you can ignore that, that's not important. He has to trust Jesus, even if it's going to create an ordeal for him. Even if he's going to lose everything. And so he struggles to do that. And he dies, 44 years old, huh? That's St. Francis. And then about 100 years later, there's someone else he also, in some way, shape, or form, understands that it's important to trust everything that Jesus says. That somehow the God who is compassion and mercy and love works through humanity and not against humanity and not in spite of humanity, works through humanity. And that my choice is somehow important. And my choice has to be the choice that Jesus asked me to make in the gospel for this, that, or the other thing even if it requires an ordeal. So he becomes a Franciscan. Because he sees a community at that time that's trying to do this. And he struggles doing this. And we don't even know who he is. But one day in the midst of his struggles, one day as he's trying to make it all happen, as he's failing and struggling and failing and struggling to trust and to live the way that Christ taught, one day as he's, as he's in the ordeal, if you will, of trust, and he's receiving the fruits of himself and working at it with his own little life, one day he sits down with his pen and he writes, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. He writes what we call the prayer of St. Francis. It's a Franciscan about a hundred years after Francis that writes it. We don't know who he is. What we do know is, to this very day, perhaps to this very hour, at this very minute in the world, someone is saying that prayer. Somehow the mercy of God is coming to people through that little prayer. It may only be a little thing that, 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 that just helps their heart rest a little, or it may be a big thing. But that little prayer, just like God going to the little girl on the side of the hill in Nazareth, that little prayer is in existence because someone trusted enough to try to do it fully. And then we see the power. 
power of God to bring peace. Can we imagine what it would be if that was the community for the last 1700 years and not an isolated person here or there? The world cannot have peace until it trusts in the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the self-revelation of God. Only God knows the way to peace. Only Jesus knows the way to peace. And therefore, if he says, this is the way, this is the way. And all politics, and all philosophers, and all novels, and all other human concoctions and inventions regardless of how much religious paraphernalia they have around them, regardless of how intelligent they seem and how right they seem, cannot bring peace, have not brought peace, will not bring peace. Jesus is our peace for us and for the world. But that depends upon us in the world trusting that he is our peace. So why don't we stop there now and we'll take, a, we'll take about a 20 minute break. Oh.